Patrick, in trying to understand free will, I think personally, what am I, tr what am I trying to do, and whether it's uh, you know, move my arm or something more serious about decision making, and you notice that it's difficult to do more than one thing at a time. We try to multitask, but it really is difficult. Uh, what is the relationship between this, uh, this aspect of free will, this capacity to make decisions? I think that's a good question. I think you're absolutely right that our capacity for voluntary action is really quite low. So put it uh, another way, free will is pretty hard. Okay, So it's quite difficult to rub your tummy and pat your head at the same time. What you tend to find is that you're making the same movement with both hands because you can't make two independent voluntary movements at the same time with your yeah, two hands, yeah, right? right? There's right, a strong right. tendency to, to collapse same. together right. and do one thing. Right. So what that seems to indicate is that the, the voluntary action system is, has to work in series. It does one thing and then it does another and it can't do two things at once. So it's very much capacity limited to use the jargon that's right. used in psychology. So we've been rather interested in trying to uh, understand and measure the uh, capacity limitation and we've done some work uh, rather recently, which is quite interesting, because it suggests that maybe, in some circumstances, the capacity for volition can be increased, that you can actually do more than one thing at a time. It, and and I mean, obviously, you can do more than one thing at a time because you can have a conversation while driving a car. But let me, let me explain to you, operationally, in terms of our experiments, what we actually mean. So we've been looking at the, the classic Libet experiment, where you make a voluntary action at a time of your own choosing which is a hallmark way of studying voluntary action. And we've been doing it in a very special set of people, which are patients with Tourette's syndrome. Mm. So Tourette's syndrome is a neuropsychiatric condition, which is characterized by involuntary movements. So these might be involuntary uh, speech utterances, facial movements, eye movements, whole body movements, tics. And these are obviously a, a real problem for the, for the patient because they can, uh, they can be socially embarrassing, they can interfere with other activities that the person's trying, that the patient wants to do. Now, the interesting thing about uh, Tourette's is that many Tourette's patients can, if they really try, voluntarily suppress these involuntary tics that they have. So I would call that, if you like, the negative aspect of volition. They're able to have free won't to stop themselves ticking for a while, not, not, not forever, because presumably then they would choose not to tick. But they can temporarily suppress their ticks. And we've done an experiment where we've simply compared the Libet situation, where you make a voluntary action, in two conditions. In one condition, we said to the patients, if you're going to tick, just tick. It's not a problem. Just try and press the button at a time of your own free will and watch the clock going around and tell us where the clock hand was when you first feel the urge to move. Classic kind of libet. And in the second condition, we've said, now please try to make sure that you don't tick at all while the clock hand is moving. So they must have this other voluntary thing they're doing at the same time. Exactly, at the same time. So in that, in that second condition, in the tick suppression condition, we're asking them to do, if you like, two volitions simultaneously. One's a negative volition, which is don't tick, and one is a positive volition, which is to, when you feel like it, press the button. While we were doing this, we recorded the uh, readiness potential over the motor areas of the brain. And the interesting finding is that the readiness potential is completely unaffected in these patients by the requirement to suppress their tics. In other words, the, the task of negative volition, of suppressing their tics, doesn't seem to have any knock-on cost on their ability to develop the brain activity and the preparation and the intention associated with the voluntary action. They can do both these things at the same time. They seem to have a volitional capacity of two things. Don't tick and make a voluntary action to press the button. And I think that's quite interesting because it suggests that the capacity for voluntary action may actually be greater than one, at least in those people. So my, my personal suspicion, my hypothesis, is that 
the patients with Tourette's have learned how to increase their volitional capacity. They've learned to suppress their tics on the one hand and to get on with, they, with what they want to do voluntarily on the, at the same time on the other hand. And they've thus trained a form of self-control or a form of volition which has made them perhaps more voluntary than the rest of us. And all credit to them for doing that as a way of dealing with the difficulties of having a tic disorder. But could we generalize as we try to multitask in, in our world with tablets and smartphones and computers that we can actually train ourselves to multitask? Is that, is that suggestible? Okay, so you can certainly, we all know, one can learn to do more than, uh, more than one thing at a time. So when you're starting out driving, it's a good advice not to try and have a conversation <laughs> while you're driving. But once you become a little bit more experienced, then you're able to drive and have a conversation at the same time. So we can all increase our capacity. But the normal way that we think about that in psychology is that you can increase your capacity because you make one of the tasks that you're doing so well learned and so automatic that it just becomes routine. That's the difference. That's the difference. But the Tourette's patients in our experiment are performing two very effortful and very voluntary tasks at the same time. So they're multitasking in volition rather than doing what the rest of us do, which is to do one thing voluntarily and try to do everything else as automatically as possible. So I think that maybe more research is needed on whether the rest of us who are lucky enough not to have uh, Tourette's syndrome could also, with appropriate training, become able to increase volitional capacity. It's quite an interesting scientific challenge to think more about how much will we can have. As you've been progressing on the experiments since I last met you in, uh, in London, uh, what's your emotional feeling? Do you feel progress is being made? Well, science is a job. Science is a, is, is a process, and it, it has its ups and downs. Um, I'm much less stressed about this particular set of experiments now than I was six months ago. So our basic trajectory is is up a little bit like a readiness potential.